What are some of the worst brand new vehicles that you can buy for 2023? That's what we're going to find out. Welcome to Carl Corner, where we help you, the consumer, master the process of car buying and car ownership. For this video, I'm going to share the worst new cars and SUVs that I test drove so far in 2023 that were such a disappointment that it would just be best to avoid buying them altogether. But before we get into this list, remember, if you enjoy and get value out of this video, make sure to subscribe and turn on the notifications. So let's start off with the first vehicle on the list, which is the Volkswagen Taos. I test drove the Taos earlier in 2023, which is a compact crossover SUV designed to compete with other similar crossovers like the Honda HRV, the Subaru Crosstrek, and the Toyota Corolla Cross. But after spending a week test driving it, I just came away completely underwhelmed. The first major disappointment has to do with the drivetrain. The lower trims come with a 1.5 liter turbocharged four cylinder engine with front wheel drive and an eight speed automatic transmission. Now obviously a lot of crossover buyers are interested in having all wheel drive, but in order to get that option, you have to trade the eight speed automatic for a seven speed dual clutch transmission, which is the first major issue with the Taos. The issue is that because dual clutch transmissions don't have a torque converter and instead have to slip the clutch in order to mimic the same effect, they can be a little bit jerky, especially at lower speeds. And that was certainly my experience when driving the Taos. Dual clutch transmissions are just not that smooth to drive, and they really don't have any place in regular everyday cars like this. And not only that, but they're also much more complicated, can be more problematic in the long run, and are also extremely expensive to repair. The same is also true of the 1.5 turbo four-cylinder engine, which does have a history of being somewhat problematic, with a spotty reputation for reliability. And that really summarizes Volkswagen in a nutshell for North America. They just don't have a solid reputation when it comes to reliability. They're also known for being more expensive to repair than a comparable Toyota or Honda. Other issues with the Taos are that it doesn't have a top safety score from NHTSA or the IIHS, and it also offers terrible value for the money. The pricing ranges between 28 to 38,000 US, or roughly 33 to 43,000 Canadian. And for that price, there are way better options that you could go for. For thousands of dollars less, you could buy something like a Subaru Crosstrek, a Honda HRV, or a Toyota Corolla Cross, all of which are gonna offer similar benefits when it comes to technology, interior space, and fuel economy, but with a much better reputation for long-term reliability, maintaining strong resale value, and a better safety score as well. So as a whole, I just can't see any good reason why you would consider the Taos when you have so many better options that you could consider instead, which is why it landed on this list. And now let's move on to the next worst vehicle that I test drove this year, which was the BMW X1. The X1 is the smallest and most affordable crossover SUV that BMW makes, and the company did give it a full redesign for 2023. But even though some of the updates did improve it in certain ways, there were other areas where the X1 did seem to take a few steps backward. The first issue has to do with the engine. Although the 2.0-liter turbo four-cylinder engine does have class-leading power and acceleration, unfortunately it also has a very jerky engine start-stop system. Although I'm not really a fan of this feature in general, I did find the one in the X1 to be especially rough and crude for some reason. And just like in the Taos, the dual clutch transmission in the X1 is also jerky at low speeds. It's quite odd that BMW chose to replace the conventional automatic transmission in the old X1 with a dual clutch given the fact that it's so unrefined, but that's what they ended up doing. And the result was a driving experience that just doesn't live up to what you would expect for a luxury SUV like this. I also had a few complaints with the X1's interior, especially the iDrive 8 infotainment system. Although it's graphically very nice to look at, it is a bit frustrating and distracting to use while driving. Because you don't have any conventional controls and have to rely on using the rather small screen to control almost everything, it can be a little bit annoying. And another issue I have with the X1 is that just like the Taos, it doesn't have an especially strong safety rating, lacking the top safety rating from the IIHS. Put it all together and I just wasn't that impressed with the X1. I just don't see much of a reason to live with all of its compromises when you can just go for a much better small luxury SUV instead. A much better design rival would include something like the Lexus NX350h, which has a much smoother ride, better fuel economy because it's a hybrid, a better safety score, and a much better reputation for long-term reliability, 
lower repair costs, and also maintaining higher resale value. And now moving on to the third vehicle on the list, we have the Mercedes EQB. For those not familiar with this one, the EQB is the all-electric version of the GLB, which is a compact crossover SUV that Mercedes introduced a few years ago. And in many ways, you could really tell that this was Mercedes' first attempt at an all-electric small SUV because it certainly had a lot of issues. For one thing, the driving range of the EQB is really not that impressive at around 230 miles or 370 kilometers on one charge. And after a week driving it in the real world, I wasn't even able to achieve that. I was barely able to manage 330 kilometers on one charge, which was a major disappointment, considering that more and more electric vehicles are able to travel at least 300 miles or 500 kilometers on a charge, including many that are a lot cheaper than the EQB. Mercedes really should have done much better than that. In every other way, the EQB really just felt like an electric version of the GLB, which is a fairly mediocre SUV as far as I'm concerned. There's nothing really especially wrong with it, but it doesn't exactly live up to the high standard that I would have for a Mercedes. And the technology on the inside, especially the infotainment system and the steering wheel controls are absolutely infuriating to use. There's just no sense of user friendliness to Mercedes system. It's certainly one of the worst setups that I've ever seen in any brand new vehicle. And to top it all off, the EQB is also incredibly expensive for what you're getting. The 350 version that I test drove ranges in price from around 60 to 70,000 US, or roughly 80 to 90,000 Canadian. And I'm sorry, but that's just way too much money. Now, even though I'm not exactly the biggest Tesla fan, I have to admit, in almost every single way, the Model Y looks like a much better buy. It has a much better driving range on one charge, access to Tesla's amazing supercharger network, a better and more user-friendly infotainment system, and all for tens of thousands less than the price of the EQB. Although, like many, I do have my own quality concerns with Tesla, but if I had to buy an all-electric SUV, there's no question, I would absolutely take the Model Y over the EQB any day of the week. And with that, it's time to move on to the next new vehicle, which is the Ford Bronco Sport Heritage Edition. It might be safe to say that this was the biggest disappointment of any new vehicle that I test drove in 2023 so far. It certainly does have a lot of character with a unique attractive look that does make it stand out on the road when compared to the majority of boring SUVs that you see. And even though I didn't have a chance to off-road it during my test drive week, it does have some off-road capability as well, which does have an appeal to some buyers. But that's really where the praise ends, because in almost every other way, the Bronco Sport is just a total letdown. Let's start with the engine, which is a pretty feeble three-cylinder turbo engine, which just doesn't have enough power to move this rather heavy SUV. You can really feel and hear this engine struggling to get this SUV moving, which is not a good thing. And on top of that, it also has all kind of quality and reliability concerns. For example, it's part of a major safety recall involving half a million vehicles with this engine, which are sometimes known to have cracked injectors, leading to a potential engine fire. I just don't get why Ford doesn't simply offer a hybrid version of the Bronco Sport, with the same hybrid system that's used in the Ford Escape and the Maverick, which is a very fuel efficient and reliable hybrid system. But unfortunately, you are stuck with either a three-cylinder turbo or a four-cylinder turbo on the higher trims, and that's a disappointment. Now you might think you're better off going for the four-cylinder turbo on the higher trims, including the Heritage Limited Edition, which might be a good thing if it weren't for that absolutely insane price tag. The Heritage Limited Edition goes for around 45 to 50,000 US, or 55 to 60,000 Canadian, which is an absurd amount of money to spend on a Bronco Sport. And even my test car had a price tag of 47,000 Canadian, which is an insane amount of money to spend on an absolutely underwhelming SUV, especially one with a weak three-cylinder engine. For that kind of money, you just have so many better alternatives that you could consider instead. Some examples include a 250 horsepower Mazda CX-5 Turbo, or if you really want that boxy off-road look, you could go for a much cheaper Toyota RAV4 Trail or Adventure trim. Whatever you do though, just don't go wasting your money on the overpriced Bronco Sport because you have way better options you could go for instead. And that brings us to the next vehicle on the list, which is the Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. 
For those who don't know, the 4xe is the plug-in hybrid version of the Grand Cherokee, which was initially introduced on the Wrangler just a few years ago. But although the idea of a plug-in hybrid might sound great for a vehicle like the Grand Cherokee, after test driving it for a week, it was just an utter disappointment. The first issue is that the hybrid system just doesn't have the smoothness and refinement that you would expect from a hybrid, at least if you're used to driving one from another brand. The way the four-cylinder turbo engine would constantly turn on and off and not very smoothly while driving was quite a surprise, showing that Jeep obviously still has some work to do when it comes to refining its hybrid system. And not only that, but the driving range in electric mode and the fuel economy in hybrid mode were also very disappointing. I was barely able to travel around 20 miles or 30 kilometers on one full charge, and in hybrid mode the fuel economy was really not that great either, barely able to break 20 miles per gallon or around 12 liters per 100 kilometers. I would expect much better numbers, performance, and general refinement from a hybrid such as this, especially one with a price tag like the Grand Cherokee. Although pricing for the 4xe starts around 62,000 US or 70,000 Canadian, my test car was pushing a price tag of nearly $90,000, and I'm sorry, but that's just an absurd amount of money to spend. $90,000 can buy you a number of much better luxury SUVs, including some hybrid SUVs, like say for example the Lexus RX 350h, which would not only have a much smoother and much more fuel efficient hybrid system, but you're also going to have a generally much better reputation for reliability, lower repair costs, and also better resale value. Although the majority of reviewers and YouTubers generally have mostly positive things to say about most new vehicles, there's no question, there are still a lot of terrible new vehicles that you just should not be wasting your money on. And although some car manufacturers might not like what I have to say sometimes, the reality is, is that as a car consultant who helps consumers, I can only recommend vehicles that I would personally buy for myself or recommend to my own family and friends. So if a particular vehicle has a history of being unreliable, expensive to repair, doesn't have a top-notch safety score, or just offers poor value for money, I'm going to let you know. So after watching this video, what are your thoughts on these vehicles? Would you still consider buying one? Let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. You can also take a look at my other car videos by clicking these links over here. Make sure to follow me on TikTok and Instagram, and if you need additional car buying advice, recommendations, or help with getting a great deal on your next new car purchase, make sure to visit carhelpcan.com. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.